Okay. Let me see. Is that recording? Oh, yeah, that's recording. And by the way, Julian, thank you for sending me the email because <laughs> it was thanks to you that I realized. Hello? Ah, I can't hear you. Hello? Guillermo, are you still there? I just can't hear ah. you. I can hear Julian, but I don't hear Guillermo. <laughs> Look, there might be a technical difficulty with the, in the room he's in. Um, David, yeah. if you want to, I, I think if you just go ahead and start, um, I think um, might as well get it moving. You think so? Yeah, he'll be he'll be uh, back soon enough. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. My oh. my internet. I, I dropped out. Uh, my internet. You know, sometimes these things happen. So, oops. Yep. So so I was just saying. Okay. So it's my great pleasure to have uh, David here speaking today who, as I was saying before, is kind of a legend uh, in logic and in philosophy more general because of his work in the theory of uh, belief revision and, and, and so on. And he has made a number of contributions to different fields in the area of logic, logic, non-monotonic logics, and a plethora of other areas. And today he's gonna be talking, by the way, I'm gonna start muting people, sorry about that, uh, just to leave David on. Uh, today he's gonna, be speaking about a piece of history uh, of logic. And I think this could be of great interest to a number of us, uh, at least from the list of people that I see in the audience. So hopefully it will be rather beneficial. David, please take it away. Okay, thanks Guillermo. And thanks for the invitation to talk uh, to, your, uh, to your group. And uh, I hope this is of interest to people that it's not just uh, old and dead and buried. So uh, the, the topic is Hamilton's uh, particles, so, uh, an exercise in third order logic. And uh, Sir William Hamilton, uh, who died in 1856, is remembered mainly for his proposal to extend the traditional four categoricals uh, to eight, by applying uh, the quantifying particles some, all, and any to the predicate term of traditional categoricals, as well as to the subject as uh, was traditionally done. And he called this step quantifying the predicate. And here is uh, the, his eight forms uh, produced by that quantification of the predicate. In the left-hand column, you have the traditional four forms, all P's and Q's, some P's uh, Q's, no P's and Q's, etc. And then his eight forms in which the predicate is also quantified by all or some or uh, any, and there's the positives and the negatives. And he had mnemonics for these, toto, total, for all, all. And for example, down here, uh, party total for some uh, any with the negation. And a close reading reveals that he intended the quantified terms to be understood in a collective rather than in a distributive manner. And de Morgan, with whom he was in uh, contact, not always very friendly, uh, de Morgan understood this and expressed the distinction between collective and distributive conceptions using his words, which haven't taken on in the, in, uh, the history of logic, but they're not bad, cumular and exemplar, cumular for collective, exemplar for distributive. But he was not ha very happy with the former perspective, rather suspicious of it, and he always discussed Hamilton's proposal with the uh, distributive or exemplar uh, perspective in mind. Since then, other commentators have followed in de Morgan's footsteps, and they've been rather comforted by the fact that the distributive, uh, sorry, that should be the distributive uh, exemplar, and the distributive, also known as exemplar perspective, 
translates readily into the language of first order logic. So you can uh, use that in the 20th century, now the 21st, in order to think about it. But formal analysis of the collective approach, in my view, needs more sophisticated resources than are available from first order logic. And the purpose of this talk is to indicate how that might be done. With a bit of a caveat, I'm not trying to find the closest coherent approximation to Hamilton's logical theory. I began my investigations trying to do that and worked on it for months until I, I came to the conclusion that none exists. And the reason for that is that Hamilton made so many incompatible pronouncements that there's no way in which a consistent reconstruction can fail to be at odds with many of those pronouncements. So whatever you do, you've, there's, there's passages in the text which say the opposite. So my goal is to give formal shape to the cumulative conception of how quantifying particles work in Hamilton's eight forms of proposition. And the basic idea is to use selection functions. I'll explain what they are and the identity function in the language of third order logic. That's the basic idea. Well, why bother with this? As early as Keynes, uh, J.N. Keynes, uh, in 1884, in his book on uh, studies and exercises in uh, logic, he spoke of the utter inadequacy and unscientific character of the Hamiltonian doctrine, which is pretty strong and uh, uh, largely justified. And Pryor in, in Formal Logic in 1955 called it his, his work a quite fantastic incompetence. And uh, on top of that, the world of traditional logic is now long gone. And so you might say, well, why bother about all of this? Uh, nevertheless, I found it a rather challenging task and I think I've got a fairly satisfying outcome. And there's a very interesting connection with Boole's indefinite symbols, which I spoke about in another talk a couple of months ago and published about in the Australasian Journal at the end of 22. Uh, and it's an interesting connection. And there is, at bottom, some kind of method in Hamilton's madness. The terminology, Hamilton called some, all, and any. He called them particles, and he also called them quantifiers. And he spoke, he, I think he might have, I'm not sure whether he invented, yeah, he must have invented the term quantifying the predicate of a categorical traditional proposition. But we have to keep in mind that, of course, Hamilton did not have the notion of a quantifier that we have since the work of Frege and, and Peirce. That is, he didn't have the notion of a sign with an attached variable with a specified scope with a distinction between free and bound occurrences of variables in uh, the expression that lies within the scope, in the substitution for terms for the variables and so, so forth. He didn't have that notion at all. And nor did he use a mathematical notation. He detested the, any intrusion of mathematics into philosophy or logic. So I always use to avoid um, anachronistic associations, I'll use Hamilton's other term, particles. Now, if you look at the eight forms, this is the same slide, uh, same table as you saw before, but here I've highlighted something because you can just read over it at first glance, but it turns out, I think, to be very significant. If you look at the tradition, uh, look at Hamilton's eight forms, they're written in a rather funny kind of stilted English, uh, in which, uh, first of all, the verb, the verb to be, both in the positive and the negative, is always in the singular, never in the plural. Contrary to the more natural formulation, for example, in a traditional form, all P's are Q's, are Q's. And also, he never uh, puts a, a plural ending on his predicates. He doesn't speak of P's and Q's. He speaks of P and Q, and that's systematic, not just in this table, but in whenever he writes on it, in his voluminous uh, uh, writings. That is, it turns out, I think, to be very important.
because it manifests uh, the uh, distributive alias exemplar versus the collective alias, the cumulative perspectives uh, on, on these uh, quantifying particles. Let's take one example. Hamilton's form three, the third one in that list there, some B is all Q. Uh, and De Morgan's reading. I put DM as a subscript to indicate that this is what De Morgan thinks. So some P is all Q. He read as saying some one P is any one Q. So he's getting rid of the uh, uh, the all for any. And he uh, finally decides that that must mean Q is a, well, we would put it now, all, all Qs are Ps. Uh, Q is a subset of P. And that interpretation in the end, the right-hand side, all Qs are Ps, is okay for Hamilton, though he doesn't go through the intermediate step and he doesn't like it, presumably. But it's not always the case with the other forms. For example, you get a divergence between uh, the exemplar and cumulative readings, between the distributive and collective ones, uh, with the first form, all P is all Q. Now, what does De Morgan do? He uh, uh, read this as saying, any one P is identical with any one Q. And that he glossed as saying, well, there is exactly one P, exactly one Q, and they are the same item. And uh, we will na naturally put that into the language of first order logic with identity, pres presuming non-emptiness for the predicate letters, uh, and write uh, the formula which you see there, for all X, if P X, then for all Y, if Q Y, X is identical with Y, and which of course is not the same as for all x, p, x, if and only if q, x, in other words, p being coextensive with q, which was Hamilton's interpretation of the first form. So the what's happening here is that De Morgan's exemplar or distributive way of thinking and, and paraphrasing leads to a quite different interpretation from, the, from Hamilton's own Humila or a collective uh, way of thinking. So the lesson is that there is a logical difference between the cumula and exemplar readings of the particles in Hamilton's eight forms. Uh, a bit of history, De Morgan began by reading this example, the one, uh, form one, distributively as P and Q are coextensive singletons, as, as I did on the previous slide. Hamilton protested that he meant only that they're coextensive, nothing for singletons. De, De Morgan later accepted in their now published correspondence. Uh, De Morgan accepted that Hamilton meant that, okay, but insisted that he should have meant the former. He should have meant, he should have interpreted his own uh, first form is uh, asserting the P and Q are coextensive singletons. So can we sort this out a bit by giving a, a more precise account uh, uh, of uh, Hamilton's cumulative conception going beyond the resources of first order logic with uh, identity? Now, I think if you read uh, through Hamilton's text, which is a daunting task because it's voluminous, and you have to uh, acquire the ability to pick out which parts are relevant. But if you read through, uh, the root of his cumulative perspective really lies, I think, in his fundamental principle that all propositions, and by that he means all his gang of eight, because he felt that his eight was sufficient to express anything that uh, deserves to be expressed, or anything that could be expressed with any kind of logical structure could be expressed by his gang of eight, uh, just as traditional Aristotelians felt that their gang of four was sufficient to express anything. But anyway, his fundamental principle is that all these propositions are really declarations of an equality or an inequality. And in that, he was reflecting a trend of the time. You find the same thing in 
George Bentham in 1827, the nephew of Jeremy, in De Morgan in his formal logic of 1847, and in Bull's uh, two books. Uh, though uh, Bentham and De Morgan uh, uh, announced the idea, but never really applied it, and Bull applied it systematically, one might almost say obsessively, uh, uh, to base his whole system on it. But for Hamilton, then reasoned as follows. Equality is symmetric. So if in any one of uh, my eight forms, we reverse the term with its attached particle, uh, the, the, the subject term with its attached particle and reverse it with the predicate term with its attached particle, if we do that, then there's no alteration of logical force. And this is his principle of unrestricted conversion, which differs from the traditional principle where you have various exceptions and limitations on conversion. Now, if we're going to reflect this fundamental principle, we should treat Hamilton's sum and all as operators taking non-empty subsets of the domain of discourse to non-empty subsets of the domain of discourse. Before I give, get into technicalities, I want to try and get rid of some red herrings. And by a red herring, I mean a feature of Hamilton's thought which is real, which is indeed significant, but which, uh, after reflection, one comes to the conclusion, or as I've come to the conclusion, are uh, independent of our problem my problem of representing his cumula uh, perspective and which easily distracts from it. The prior, I think, was distracted. The Neils in the development of logic were distracted by these red herrings and I was distracted for quite some time. And the four red herrings are restriction to non-empty terms, Hamilton's penchant for an exclusive use of some, the distinction, uh, the linguistic distinction of any versus all, and the Hamilton's anomalous treatment of the eighth form. I'll go quickly through these. The restriction to non-empty terms. Everybody at the time did it. Even Bull, when he was doing syllogistic, though he forgot about it when he went beyond syllogistic. It's messy in a general theory because it, it creates problems for any simple principle of substitution but it's fine for the very limited collection of formulae that are going to be needed in our present task of understanding Hamilton's cumulative conception. So what I'm going to do is just uh, modulate all semantic definitions of classical higher order logic, valuation, consequence validity, et cetera, by the requirement that predicate letters get non-empty subsets of the domain as values. And so it's not a problem. It's, it's, it's a red herring. Red herring two. Hamilton's penchant for an exclusive use of some. Now there, there's a real mess. Hamilton declares at four, or if you add in a declaration of his uh, disciple Baines, five different policies. One policy, and uh, I, there's passages that uh, I, if anybody needs uh, citations, uh, I can produce them. Uh, passages where he said, Always, I always use some exclusively, as meaning at least one, but not a lot. Others where he says, we should presume it to be exclusive unless said otherwise. Others where he says, uh, he's treating as, as inclu inclusive, at least one, possibly all, in those forms with two occurrences of the same particle, two sums or two alls or two anys and exclusive elsewhere, which is a really weird policy. Uh, elsewhere, he says they should be treated side by side on an equal footing, and you analyze all the eight propositions uh, in, in both ways. And according to disciple Baines, uh, who was uh, tested by de Morgan after Hamilton's death to try and uh, give some more information on this, in correspondence, he said, well, perhaps uh, Hamilton was treating it as exclusive in immediate inference and treating it as inclusive in syllogistic, which is a fifth probability. Now, I think that most of Hamilton's contradictions concerning quantification of the predicate are associated in one way or another with the vacillations or contradictions, however you like to look at it, on this issue. 
I think he never made up his mind. He never worked out the consequences of his mooted options, though he had a very good excuse. He had uh, a stroke in 1846 from which he never fully recovered. Uh, or was it 1844? Anyway, 44, 46, and never fully recovered. And then he had uh, intermittent inflammatory ailments. Uh, and so, uh, what he worked with an amanuensis. Uh, so anyway, but he never worked it out. And uh, we know that any element of exclusivity in our formulations tends to damage symmetries. So I'm going to proceed inclusively all the way, even though this departs from uh, umpteen declarations you find in Hamilton. Uh, I'm going to use proceed inclusively. The third red herring is this distinction between any and all in the eight uh, in the eight forms. You, you might remember from the slide I put up in the positive forms he uses all, and in the negative forms he uses any. And uh, William and Martha and Neil say in their development of logic, there's something radically wrong in a scheme which involves a switch from positive to negative, from the collective all to the distributive any. And I, I said, well, yes, I think for ordinary language, any does often suggest the distributive reading, while all can usually, in most contexts, be, be understood both ways, including in the collective reading. But that's not the case for Hamilton. There is a, 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 a very interesting passage in which he says that what he was queried on this, uh, by the Morgan, and he says that while he's following common language, that's his term, and ordinary speech, also his term, that's just stylistic. And he says a scientific presentation, that's his term again, would use all everywhere. So that's what I'm going to do. Finally, he has a very weird, uh, and I would say anomalous treatment of his eighth form, which is the form, some P is not some Q. Uh, and he treats that as true just when there is at least one item that is a P, and at least one item differing from it, that is a Q. Equivalently, if we presume, as we do, I'm going to do right through this talk, if we presume that P and Q are non-empty, in other words, there's at least one P, at least one Q, then equivalently, when uh, there's more than one element of uh, the union of P and Q. Thus, for Hamilton, his eighth form, which says, uh, for in our language here, P union Q is great, has more, more than one element, is not the contradictory of one, which said that P and Q are coextensive. And absolutely everybody from De Morgan on has found this inelegant, puzzling. And so it's natural to ask why did Hamilton do that? And the answer is, and this is why it's a red herring, is because he wanted to treat eight as the kingpin of his theory of definition by genus and difference. Now, definition by genus and difference is essentially an act of partitioning a non-empty set into two non-empty cells and giving one of them a name. It can be done if and only if the set that one partitions has more than one element. And Hamilton wanted to express that criterion, like everything else in logic, with one of his forms. And he used the substitution instance of his eighth form for the job, namely that the number of elements of a P, uh, in other words, of P union P, is greater than one. Today, I think that seems a pretty poor justification for his interpretation of eight. There's no need even to bring the form eight into the picture to say that a set has more than one element and get on with the theory of definition by genus and difference. So I'm going to ignore the anomalous treatment of eight. So what I want to do now, and this is getting really into the center of the talk, is uh, described to you uh, two protocols for translating. Uh, it's uh, pretty much a uh, an algorithm, uh, 
uh, translating from Hamilton's verbal formulations of his eight forms to formulae of third order logic. And the bird's eye view before getting uh, the details, both of them use inequality and equality between su non empty subsets of the domain of discourse. The identity function on non empty domains, uh, non empty subsets of the domain of discourse. In other words, it takes such non empty subsets as argument and as value. And a variable ranging over selection functions. And these selection functions take any non empty subset of the domain of discourse to a non empty subset of itself, quantifying. Uh, and also we'll need to quantify on that variable. So this quantification on the selection function is what makes everything in the end third order. Selection functions will be uh, familiar to any of you who've worked in non-monotonic reasoning or in belief revision where they have uh, in the 20th century taken a prominent place. And the two protocols or quasi algorithms will differ in how they put these uh, components together, but they end up give, giving us equivalent outputs. So here's the first pro translation protocol. And I divide, uh, divide it into the four affirmative forms of Hamilton and the, then uh, the uh, four negative forms. So for the affirmative forms, you translate is as equality between su non-empty subsets of the domain of discourse, uh, or as the identity function uh, acting on them. Oh, pardon, sorry, what did I do there? Uh, all as the identity function acting on them, and some as a variable for selection functions acting on them them being the non-empty subsets of the demand discourse. And the, <clears throat> the binding will be done existentially. So the input will be any uh, one of his verbal expressions of the form sum or all B is sum or all Q. You replace is by the equality sign. You just delete all the recurrences of all. Uh, and you replace some uh, P, some Q, by uh, v of p, v of q, and you bind the whole thing with a free ver with an existential quantifier. And the convention we're using for the choice of variable is if a particle has two occurrences in the verbal form, two sums, use the same variable each time, not v and w, but just v each time with one quantifier. And likewise for the negative forms in the second protocol, uh, to come, though we'll see later on what happens if you, if you vary that convention. So the output from that um, process gives you uh, the uh, translation of all P is all Q is P is equal to Q. Uh, he uh, treating the predicate letters as really variables ranging over subsets of the domain of this course. All P is some Q is that there is a selection function such that P equals V of Q. Some P is all Q, there is a selection function such that VP equals Q. And some P is some Q, there is a selection function such that VP equals VQ. And so these are formulae in third order logic. And they simplify, assuming non emptiness of P and Q, they simplify to that simplifies to itself, to P is a subset of Q, uh, Q is a subset of P, and that P and Q have non-empty intersection. So they simplify very nicely. But the interesting thing is the simplifications are really for uh, quick calculation purposes. When you want to check out something, a relation between one and the other of these things, uh, but the output is the translation, which reveals the conceptual structure, I think, of what Hamilton is doing. So for the negative forms, you dualize. You translate is not as inequality between subsets of the domain of discourse. Stum, at this time, as the identity function, that was all before, 
any as a variable selection functions and bind universal bind universally everything is dualized so there's if you take an input you replace the is not by not equals delete the occurrences of some replace any p or any q by v of p and q and bind the variable universally and you get the outputs which are indicate highlighted in yellow in this slide uh for every selection function v uh v of p is distinct from v of q uh, for every selection function v v of p is distinction from q and uh so on for the other two for all for every selection function v p is distinct from v of q and p is not equal to q and they simplify in the natural manner uh uh, always assuming non-emptiness of P and Q, otherwise you, you don't get these simplifications um, to uh, to these. And you, well, to anticipate something, you, you see that there's a, an, uh, there's a symmetry here around an axis, which if you draw a line between four and five, between the positive and the negative forms, uh, and then have concentric arcs, uh, you have uh, contradictories, that is, the first one is, equi is equivalent to, in fact, is the negation, well, look at this side, is equivalent to the negation of the last one. The second is equivalent to the negation of the uh, seventh and so on, which is rather nice. Now, here's a second translation protocol. And the basic idea behind it is to treat the copier is, uh, rather differently. Treated as uh, not asserting equality of the left-hand side to the right-hand side, but rather as asserting that something is or, or is not equal to the empty set. And perhaps rather paradoxically, we translate is as not equal to the empty set. Um, um, as the identity function this is in the affirmative forms under the uh, second translation protocol sum as a variable for selection functions and we bind existentially so there's a typical there's a a format for the negative hamilton's negative forms replace da 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 is not da da do by such and such intersected with so and so is uh equal to the empty set Delete all occurrences of any, replace some uh, by V of uh, so and so, and bind existentially. And uh, that's for the negative forms. I think I jumped from the positive to the negative. There's the affirmative. Uh, not equal to empty set, and you, you make these replacements, and for the negative, you dualize, you dualize. And then you get these outputs, which are highlighted in yellow on the same on the same basic slide, and uh, they're different formulae from the ones from the first output. For example, uh, for the positives here, you had uh, existential quantifiers and something without quantifiers. Here you have universal quantifiers and something else without quantifiers, and the situation reversed here. But they're equivalent. They're logically equivalent, again, assuming P and Q are non-empty, and so also uh, simplify to what we have in that middle column. So that's rather nice, two different ways of uh, getting essentially the same result, each one conceptualizing uh, with, uh, with the identity function on subsets of the domain of discourse, with selection functions, but treating the copula differently in the two cases. No, I think I've said that the equivalent, the two outputs are equivalent row-wise to each other, and they can be simplified for calculations. And they're the simplifications. Okay. So here's some historical comparisons because um, other people have written on this. The outputs that I've given, the protocols are new. I don't, I've never seen anybody attempt that kind of thing in third order logic. Uh, but the outputs agree up to equivalence modulo or non-empty reading and non-empty values of the predicate of p and q uh, they agree with hamilton except for his anomalous reading of eight uh, 
they agreed agree with De Morgan's preferred array, except for one and eight. And there one has to be careful. I'm not going to get into details in the talk in the in a background paper. Uh, he, De Morgan has his own preferred array, but he has his interpretation of what he thinks Hamilton meant. And there's the initial interpretation, and then there's the corrected interpretation of what he thinks Hamilton meant after Hamilton protested. So there's De Morgan really had three ways of looking at this, but I'm looking at his own preferred way of reading. Uh, so it agrees except for the first and the last form. And it agrees exactly with the interpretation of Fogelin's first paper of 1976. Uh, not with his second one, which he thought he was correcting himself, but in fact, he's not. And in fact, he, he, he's obviously didn't have a very wide view of the literature because in De Morgan because uh, his revised interpretation in the second paper of 1976 is in fact exactly the same as De Morgan's preferred array. So it, there's, uh, it, but it agrees exactly with Fogel. But Fogelin expresses his outputs in words only, without symbols. And you can see he's thinking in symbols, though he, he doesn't use them. He's writing in a philosophical journal. That might be the reason. And writing for philosophers, I presume. Uh, he's thinking in symbols, but he's thinking in first-order logic with identity. So, some possible variants. One could just play around and use the first protocol for the affirmatives and the second protocol for the negatives. And if you do that, all quantifiers come out existential. That's rather nice. And you get the same e equivalent outputs. Or you can do the opposite. You can use the first protocol for the negatives and the second protocol for the affirmatives. And all the quantifiers come out universal and you get equivalent outputs. And that's nice too. But it's just playing around. Uh, but you can think, well, how can I get De Morgan's preferred outputs, which uh, are a little bit different? I think I'll have that up on the next slide. You can get his preferred outputs by a very simple maneuver. Take the second protocol, not the first one, doesn't work for the first, and tweak the convention for variables. And put as your new convention for variables, if a particle, some or any or all, has two occurrences in the verbal form of Hamilton, as in some P's are not some Q's. Well, no, he doesn't say uh, some P is not some Q. Uh, use distinct variables to correspond to the two sums, V and W. If you do that, then you get the same out equivalent outputs everywhere. Uh, in fact, the same outputs everywhere. Uh, on the second uh, protocol, except for the first and the last. And in the first, you get for all V and for all W. V of P intersected with V of Q is non-empty. And here you get, which is essentially its negation, there is a V and there is a W such that V and P intersected with V and Q is empty. And these say respectively that the union of P and Q is a singleton. In other words, P and Q uh, each of them singletons, because that's presumed from the beginning, and they coincide, they're coextensive, they're coextensive singletons, which is exactly Hamilton, um, De Morgan's preferred reading. And here it's uh, it's negation. Uh, the, um, the union of P and Q has more than one element. And, we've, and it preserves, obviously, the pattern of contradictories. The, uh, the last is the contradictory of the first. Now, that's for Hamilton. I want to end, I think I'm getting near my time, quarter to six here, uh, a few more minutes, to draw attention to an interesting relationship between uh, Hamilton's particles and eight forms and Boole's so-called indefinite symbols, or he called them indefinite symbols. Boole systematically uh, treated all propositions as equations. But unlike Hamilton, Hamilton had a prism of just eight forms, not much bigger than the, the traditional prism, prism of four. Uh, 
Uh, but Boole allowed an infinite variety of, uh, of equations. And actually, I'll digress a moment to say Boole is the first logician that I know of, I may be wrong, but the first one I know of to work with an implicitly recursive definition of the syntax of logic, similar to that of the syntax of algebra. In other words, you can have terms of any length and complexity on the left and right of your equality sign. Rather than with a finite list of forms, the four of traditional logic or the eight of Hamilton. Now, that is a revolution in my opinion that has not been generally recognized as such. The, uh, the, uh, the use of a recursive notion of the syntax of logic. But to express traditional categoricals, which he had to do at the beginning of uh, the mathematical analysis of logic to get anybody to read any further, because that was what logic was in his time. He used what he called indefinite symbols, V and W. That's why I've used the same symbols. They were gradually abandoned by his successors, but one can make sense of them. Uh, in an interesting paper of 1979, Laita remarked laconically and said nothing else. It is said in passing, Boole's operator V is in some ways parallel to Hamilton's concept of the indefinite. And I've been working uh, uh, last year on uh, Boole's indefinite symbols. And, I, and one can show that uh, the indefinite symbol can be seen as a variable ranging over selection functions with implicit existential, existential quantification. The implicit existential quantification was recognized by Heilperin in 1986 and the interpretation using selection functions by myself, you put them together. Now, Boole had several, so there's, there's obviously, there's something in the air here. We've got these selection functions. Boole had several ways of representing categoricals. <clears throat> sometimes with and sometimes without indefinite symbols. But I'm going to pick out ones which have a particular interest for our comparison with Hamilton. And I've highlighted them here. Uh, the traditional, he, he never referred to Hamilton's eight forms. So I've written under Hamilton's second form, I've written its traditional counterpart and likewise. So we're looking at the four traditional forms, the A, I, E and, and O uh, with Hamilton's, uh, Hamilton's uh, version written alongside. And uh, that was um, the, uh, sorry, that was, Oh, that was the first um, um, uh, protocol transcription. So all, P, all P's and Q's here represented as X equals VY, no brackets, just VY. He was well, not clear, but he tended, especially in, in 1854 in uh, Laws of Thought, he tended to treat V as a variable ranging over of uh, subsets of the domain of discourse. I'm treating it as a selection function. But if you look at the structure, you've got something very similar. Think of it, X as the counterpart of P, Y as the counterpart of Q. Uh, he doesn't know what an existential quantifier is, uh, but he's got P equals V of Q, but he, he, he's not think, he doesn't realize that he's using the selection function. The same thing here. Some P's are some Q's, this was a very, Notorious representation, which I discuss in my paper in the Australasian Journal of Logic at the end of last year, Vx equals Vy. It corresponds to the translation of the first protocol. This, of course, there's no uh, there's uh, no p's or q's. X x intersected with y is empty, or he wrote equals zero. And this now we're looking at the correspondence with the second protocol. That corresponds to that. And some P's are not Q's. One of his representations is this, and that corresponds uh, with the representation of the second protocol. So to sum that up, what we can say is that not only was Boole implicitly using selection functions for his indefinite symbols, and implicitly using existential quantification over them, 
but he was doing so <clears throat> or at least some of his representations in a way which is almost a straight transcription of my first protocol and my second protocol in application to the four traditions. That's not so surprising because there's a little passage in the preface of the mathematical analysis of logic 1847, which is easy to read over as of no significance, but it is of significance. Bull obviously doesn't want to get into polemics, unlike de Morgan who allowed himself to be drawn into a disastrous polemic with Hamilton. In the spring of the present year, my attention was directed to the question then moved between Sir William Hamilton and Professor de Morgan. And I was induced by the interest which it inspired to resume the almost forgotten thread of former inquiries. He says no more, at least not in any surviving published uh, text that I have found. But it would seem that, one, the idea of using indefinite symbols in this role came in part from having read, which he had read, uh, Hamilton's treatment of quantifying particles, some, all, and any. On the other hand, there is another part. He had already used something similar in his theory of differential equations. But uh, so uh, the two came together in his mind. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Antonielli Garcia Rodriguez for drawing my attention to the probable influence of Hamilton on Bull's use of indefinite symbols. Uh, I'd also thank her for helpful comments on a draft of this talk. And uh, Antonielli suggested something which I won't take up because it's not my cup of tea, but uh, it might be hers, I don't know, and it might be yours. Uh, what if, if we try to represent Hamilton's eight forms in the, uh, the logic of Mariology? That could be interesting, perhaps. I've made no precise calls to Hamilton's texts, but every claim I make about his thinking are based on specific passages between a, a paper I've prepared, but I can also give them to you by email or in the discussion, if you like. So that is the end of the talk. Thank you.